Good morning. My name is Pastor Nathan Deesom. I'm so thrilled to be here exploring God's Word with you. We are in a very unique sermon series. This is the second week of our sermon series called Apologetics. That is a word that comes from a Greek word, apologia. We have a very similar word in English, apology. And while in English, apology usually sounds like, I'm sorry, making amends for something that you know, didn't go correct, or maybe you're even sorry that something happened to someone that you didn't cause at all, apologia this Greek concept, it doesn't mean that at all. It actually means to make a defense, to explain why something you've done, you did, right? In a legal sense, you might come before the judge and he say, why'd you do that, man? And you're like, well, there's a reasonable reason, judge, and here is my apology, all right? So what we have in 1 Peter 3.15, which is the foundational verse of Christian apologetics, we see this. Peter says, but in your hearts, in your hearts, honor Christ Jesus as the Lord, the Lord as holy, Always being prepared to make a defense. Always being prepared to apologia, to explain, to give an answer to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. I don't know if you've ever encountered someone who finds out that you're a Christ follower. You believe in Jesus, right? You've placed your faith in Jesus. You really do believe that this historical man, Jesus, who came and walked this earth some 2,000-ish years ago, that he uh, lived a perfect life, that he was God, put on human flesh, the God who is man, that you believe this. You believe he died for your sins and then rose again three days later. He died so that we can be forgiven for our sins, and then he rose so that if we place our faith in him, we can be saved from not only our own sin and from this fallen, broken, decaying, you know, imploding world, and that he'll come again as king. I believe it. And they say, why? Why? Why do you believe that? What Peter has said is, you need to be ready to tell them why. A big part of it, not a small part of it, by the way, but this isn't something I can give you a sermon on. I can, I can perhaps help you develop this. But a big part of the reason that you believe is your own experience. What we call that is testimony. What Jesus has done for you in your life. That's an important part of it. Illustrated within Scripture over and over again and highly effective at sharing your faith. However, there's another piece of it, and it is what Peter has told us to do. Let's be ready to give a reason. When someone asks, why, why do you believe there's a God at all? We give a reason. Philosophically, we call it an argument, but it's not an argument. Well, your mama wears combat boots sort of a thing, right? <laughs> That's not the kind of argument we're talking about. Um, an argument means it's just organized. I do have a reason to believe these things. Last week, we looked at one of these arguments called the cosmological argument. The cosmological argument actually has a lot of pieces, but at its most basic, it, it is, even before we pick up the Bible, we can both observe and um, scientific evidence makes it uh, conclusive, inescapable, that this, this world, this universe was not always here. A ways back, scientists preferred that. They openly said, I'd rather have an eternal universe, a universe that was always here, self-existing. And then they found out through their own methods, no, a good ways back, and we can, we can quibble, and we can, we, can, we can get bogged down in how old the earth is or how old the universe is. I'm not going to do that today. Not that I don't like doing that. I love, I love the bog. I'm mayor of the bog. I was born in the bog, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> but if we could agree on this, a finite time ago, this whole universe burst into existence seemingly from nothing. Science says it, and you know what else says it? Genesis and the whole witness of Scripture. So what we find out from the cosmological argument, even before we ever open God's Word, because if you're interacting with someone saying, why do you believe that? And you say, well, the Bible says, which is useful, by the way. Some people are prepared to hear what the Bible says, and that can be very persuasive. The Bible tells us that the word of the Lord doesn't produce void. It doesn't return void. But you may encounter a person like, no, 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 put that away. I don't, have, I don't trust in that. Do you have anything besides that? And the answer is, yeah, there's a lot besides that. If this un everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. And if by the universe I mean all time, all space, all matter, all energy, I don't mean that. That's what, that's what scientists refer to by what they call, this is a fine term, I guess, the Big Bang. We would call it the moment of creation. If all time, all space, all matter, all energy burst into existence that time, then its cause can't be timey, temporal, timey. Well, it's Doctor Who, timey, wimey stuff. It can't be part of time. It can't take up space. It actually needs to 
encompass and transcend all space. It can't be made of matter. Otherwise, how would it have made itself, created matter? It can't be energy. So what's a timeless, spaceless, immaterial, eternal thing? And I would add conscious, because how could the cause be eternal, but the effect, the universe, be temporal? Well, that means that that cause has to be able to choose when to do it. So if we have this incredibly powerful, timeless, spaceless, immaterial mind who is the cause for all this, a very reasonable cause for all this, what's that starting to sound like? God. That is a reason, that's an apologia, that's a defense for why we have this hope. We're going to take a look at a new kind of apologia today called the teleological argument, but this is still a sermon. This isn't just an apologetics lecture. I like apologetics lectures, but we're here. I don't want to be talking about anything today that isn't from Scripture or conformed to Scripture. And fortunately, we got the psalmist David talking about the same thing. Let's take a look about what we're going to be talking about today. David says in Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16, for you, God, this is the psalmist David writing a psalm of worship. So not only is this God's inspired word, it is worshipful. <laughs> Did anyone see any of the pictures that Pastor Mike put up of his first several boards that came off, the, uh, that came off his mill? And it's a poplar, and there are, there are far more beautiful trees than that. And it, it's, I, it was his third or fourth board I went over to say, hey, this is cool, man, you got it working. And he goes, look at this, look at this. Would you look at that? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. He goes, look at this grain. God put this in here. And we get to see it because we cut it like this. God sees it all the time. And it inspires worship. What we're about to see, David had the same attitude, and what we're about to study today, it won't just be tree grain, although that is, that's enough to inspire worship. We're going to be looking at one particular thing, and it's about us, inside us. Let's take a look. For you, God, formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. David, he's talking about God's omnipotence, if you read the context a little bit before this. I encourage you to read the rest of one, Psalm 139, maybe this week. He says, God, you, you could do anything. You made me. Everything that's going on inside of me, you made. You put me together piece by piece when I was still in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He says, the, 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 the processes that bring me together, that bring every human being together, are so astonishing. He was aware of this even as far back as he was, and he knows far less about the process than we do, and we still would be saying the same thing. We haven't unpacked all of the intricacies of what brings our innermost things together. We know a lot about it, and every time we learn something more, God becomes more amazing, as I hope we'll see here in just a moment. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame, what he's referring to poetically is literally he's talking about a skeleton, the thing that makes humans look like this. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Every commentary that I encountered that I trust said that that is a, a euphemism for how when things are happening inside, I've been thinking about this a lot recently because Rachel is super preggers and we got a couple other uh, ladies ex expecting, and I've been thinking about this. Inside right now, my son, we're fighting about a name. I'll have a name for you guys when I have a name. <laughs> uh, I thought about this. He is being, the, the po poetically, we talk about knitted or stitched. His constituent parts are coming together by God's design. And I don't just mean in a, in a metaphysical way, which is also true, but even what we know about genetics and human processes, what an amazing and astonishing thing. We're going to take a look at it today. Intricately woven in the depths of the earth, in secret, in this, in this astonishing, I'm holding my belly because that's where it happens on ladies. <laughs> your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. This last verse it seems fairly obvious to me that he's talking about God's omniscience, that God knows all things, past, present, future, true, false, possible, hypothetical. God, his knowledge is unlimited. So that's what David's talking about. Because he transcends time, in some ways, ah, eh, no, it doesn't make it any less amazing, but we can see how he would know, because my future isn't future to God, and my past isn't past to God. It's all in his eternal now. When we say that God is the Alpha and the Omega, he is at this moment in his own divine experience, which we can't possibly <laughs> fully understand. He is at the beginning at creation, and he is standing there at Armageddon, and he is in the eternal state in heaven with us already right now. It is because of what we are 
temporal, material, subject to space and energy, that we're heading towards it. That's an amazing thing. That's part of what David meant. But there's an additional thing that I don't even think David realized that he meant. God knows every one of your days as they are yet un as there are yet none of them at and before our birth because he has written the code of our DNA. God knew how tall I was likely to be and every doctor told me that it was going to be 6 feet tall, those knuckleheads, what do they know? They don't know, my, they don't know my days before they are yet written. Part of it may be that I was a rambunctious kid and I hurt myself a lot and I went to the um, emergency room very often and they asked me one time in my parents' presence, is everything okay? Right? <laughs> I was like, everything's fine. I just, I just ride a bike. I broke my arm. Stuff happens, man. Get off me. <laughs> but written within me and written in you, it happens all over Scripture. He knows the hairs on your head, not only because he knows their current count. He knows what kind of hair he gave you. And we by degrees, are learning more and more about, not necessarily how he knows it, but how he did those things, and that is what I want to discuss today as we discuss the teleological argument. Telos is a Greek word which means destination, aim, where things are targeted, and this argument arises in many different ways. There's a lot of different forms of the teleological argument where when you look at his created world, right? When you're interacting with a person who doesn't believe in Jesus and they're not so interested in what the Bible has to say, we could start just in what the, uh, theologians call the book of nature, that there are things that have a purpose, that they have an, a goal, an aim, a reason for being. And if we can unpack those things, what that implies is somebody imbued it with purpose. Somebody gave it a goal. Somebody has orchestrated these things. As a matter of fact, before the late 19th century, so like the late 1800s, when uh, scientific materialism came in as a worldview where all there is is matter. Are we, you and me, baby, ain't nothing but man. No, I don't like that song. Right? When basically all we are is matter and energy and nothing else has meaning. When that came into existence, before that, most every brilliant scientist that you ever learned about in school, Isaac Newton, Galileo, all of them believed in God, more specifically believed in Jesus, and it was the foundation for how we do science at all. Because we have a God who has created order in the universe, we can expect it to behave in an orderly way, and we can analyze that order and understand more about it. Isn't that interesting? The, through the late 19th and early 20th, and pretty much the entire, uh, entirety of the 20th century, 1900s, this concept that we can be doing science at all without the foundation of an orderly God who has created this order. The reason we can do an experiment and expect the same result time after time is because God has designed this world with laws and order and reason. We're only going to look at one of them today, but there's lots of them. Actually, I'm going to give you a quick drive-by preview. It pains me that this couldn't come up in today's message, but there is one that you can Google later. Maybe I'll put some stuff out on Facebook this week if you want to read about this later, called the Anthropic Principle. Anthropic comes from a, uh, the word for man, that the universe and all of its tiny pieces, the force of gravity, the force of electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force which holds the nucleus of a cell together. You guys remember the, nu not a cell, the nucleus of an a atom together? Do you know that the nucleus of an atom is made of protons? They're positively charged. When things have the same charge, what do they try to do? They resist each other. They, they fly away. Why is it that all the protons stay together in the middle? Scientists call, oh, there's a strong force that makes it happen. Wow. <laughs> now, they would accuse me of God of the gaps, which we'll discuss in a minute. I would say, God is holding every atom together. In him, we live and move and have our being. But that's just my faith. We're going we're gonna to only, only look at reason today. But this anthropic principle, if the strong nuclear force or the weak nuclear force, which keeps the electrons, which rotate the nucleus, which doesn't let them move any closer, if electromagnetism, if the average distance of galaxies, if the number of planets that we have in our solar system, if the distance of the sun to the earth was off by the smallest measure, life for humans couldn't exist. I almost did this entire message on that, but I picked another thing that I like instead. Anthropic principle, also called fine-tuning, also called the Goldilocks universe. Maybe I'll put some stuff on Facebook. That is another strong evidence. Uh, what was his name? I'll remember it later, and I'll put it on Facebook. But there was a very famous scientist who had started out an atheist and wound up converting to, he only got as far as deism. He only got as far as admitting that there is a God, but he wasn't interested in knowing him. Because as we learned in Romans last week, Romans 1, he suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. But anyway, what he said is, there is now sufficient evidence that someone has monkeyed with physics, chemistry, and biology. 
And that's why he understands that there is a divine being. It breaks my heart that he wasn't willing to know him. We're going to be looking at one piece of the teleological, teleological argument. It's scientific, but it's fun. And I get a lot of this from uh, the books, although they have a lot of wonderful videos too. So if you're not so down with the reading, right? Uh, <laughs> um, but one is by a gentleman named Stephen Meyer, who's amazing. And the other guy is Michael Behe. If you want to take a look at here, here they are. Those look like a couple science nerds, right? Those are, some those are some trustworthy guys. I love these guys. These guys are two, absolute, two of my absolute heroes. Um, Stephen Meyer, just to let you know, remember how last week I used a lot of quotes from atheists, or at least agnostics? Um, I, these, guys, these guys are Christians because they have analyzed this science and they say, man, it's, it's inescapable. Anyway, Stephen Meyer, the uh, gentleman with the part, <clears throat> is the director of the Discovery Institute, Center for Science and Culture. He was a geophysicist. He has written unbelievable books, Darwin's Doubt, Signature in the Cell, and most recently, The Return of the God Hypothesis. He is a big advocate for intelligent design being taught alongside, as a theory, other, uh, other explanations for the origin of life and things of that nature in schools. Sometimes he finds success, and sometimes he doesn't in different states. Stephen Meyer is amazing. Michael Behe, biochemist and professor at Lehigh University, in Pennsylvania, senior fellow at the Discovery Institute. He wrote a book, and it's there behind him, called Darwin's Black Box. Um, I highly recommend both of those, or if you were to look them up on YouTube, they are amazing, Stephen Meyer and Michael Behe. But the argument that we're going to be looking at today starts with a hypothetical. If you were walking through the woods, and you encountered this Rolex watch laying on the ground, what would your first thought be other than, da ha, dog, I found like several hundred dollars, I'm written now. If you... Would you think to yourself, man, look what wind and time and erosion did right here. No, that would be ridiculous. Even if you didn't know what a Rolex watch was, you would observe it for a little bit and you would see its mechanism and you would see the way that it is very consistent and you would observe its purpose, its telos, its goal, its reason. You would say, somebody made this, right? That is a very reasonable explanation. However, many people suppressing the truth and unrighteousness look out into the world and they don't realize that there are mechanisms at work in nature that are far more complex and interesting than a watch and have been made by a designer, by an engineer. Let's start with the most basic among them. And this is an amoeba. <laughs> All right. A single cell organism. The DNA that it stores in a single amoeba, and this is comparable to one of our cells, is 45 trillion times more information storage than our best computer chip. Our computer chips are doing a great job. You, you should see the games I have on my phone, right? 45 trillion times more because of DNA. The thinking and we all find it ridiculous that this watch could come together through natural, unguided, accidental, you might say, processes. We all would throw that out as hogwash. But the information, the design, the code, as it were, that is in every living thing, we say, oh no, that would be no problem just to come, around, uh, come about by chance and, and happenstance. Let's make it a little bit more specific. Today we're going to be talking primarily about this idea of DNA. I like it because, you know, all through, all through recent history, it was taught to us in science class. It was in every X-Men cartoon, right? I know all about DNA. No. <laughs> you guys remember Alphabet Serial, right? It was not my favorite because it's dull, right? But let's say that we hit it, <laughs> but it was, uh, it was healthy. It's got a whole bunch of alphabet pieces. Imagine that you wake up one day on a Saturday. You want to watch some cartoons and your eye is itchy because I don't know what it is about the morning that makes that. You walk into, the, uh, into your dining room near your kitchen, and you see, oh, man, the box is spilled. Something must have happened. But a cl upon closer inspection, you see that some of the alphabets say this. <laughs> T-A-K-E-O-U-T-T-H-E-G-A-R-B-A-G-E -E -E hyphen M-O-M. You know, that almost looks like take out the garbage mom. What an amazing coincidence. No, you would immediately know that your mom, who's pretty sassy and, and hilarious and clever, has left you a message. It is so incredibly improbable that this message would come together accidentally. It is far more reasonable to think, no, somebody wrote this message. That's how messages work. This denotes information. Information comes from informants, writers, 
we would know that there was an intelligent design here from an intelligent being, a super intelligent being, your mom. Right? The thing is that our DNA is a language. This is, this is not stuff I'm making up. Maybe you've heard this before. This is what scientists say. It is a code. It is a coded language with only four letters, but a tremendous vocabulary that sets the design for every piece of who and what you are. Far more interesting than a message, take out the garbage mom, that written into every one of your 100 trillion cells is a message of love and purpose. Tell us that God has written to make you. And then he wrote a slightly different one to make me, and a slightly different one to make your neighbor, and a slightly different one to make your boss. And you don't like that message very much. <laughs> As I mentioned before, it has been said that a single cell has enough information to house 100,000 volumes, or no, I'm sorry, 1,000 volumes of Encyclopedia Britannica, the whole, the whole set, not a single uh, issue. The thing about this, in my opinion, already, even before we've gotten very much further through the message, is that life, that degree of design, that degree of language requires a writer. Connor, you work with computers, right? As a matter of fact, he's a computer guy. <laughs> you, you have to code things, right? Code requires a lot of effort, a lot of work. If someone found one of the codes that you wrote for your company to do a thing, and they're like, look how this came together by chance and circumstance, you would be, you'd be infuriated. I spent hours writing that, right? If it has a purpose, if it's information, there is a coder. How do you think God feels that so many people suppressing the truth and unrighteousness are aware now, keenly aware, far more aware than David ever was, that within our cells, within our chromosomes, is a language, a code of love that makes you. And they say, oh, I guess this was accidental. It would be far less reasonable to think that than it would be to say, to truly think, oh, this Rolex came together through time chance. It'd be far easier for the wind, far more likely for the rain, far more likely for weather and time to design that watch than for the 100 trillion cells, each containing 1,000 volumes. Of, I, I, it, the numbers begin to break down about how rich and dense you are packed with information about you. There is a very famous atheist. He was formerly a uh, professor of biology at... Um, Oxford, but he gave that up to basically be an atheist rock star. I heard him speak at Queen College in, uh, in Charlotte and a bunch of people from my seminary, which specializes in apologetics. We went, and we went with gentleness and respect, right? That's what First Peter says, gentleness and respect. And oftentimes during a lecture, there's some Q&A. We went down and asked him a few questions about this. And do you know, he basically wrote an entire book suggesting this, that the watch that you found in the woods, though we know that it hasn't been, it, it has a designer. Even though there appears to be, and he, he admits, there appears to be a tremendous amount of design that really time and, and nature and random chance are a blind watchmaker that has brought you together. Which of those conclusions seems more reasonable to you? I want to explain, I, I want to admit this from, from, from the jump. Unlike last week's cosmological argument, which in my opinion is almost a deduction, that it is almost inescapable to me, like that one scientist said, people really like the quotes that I put up on Facebook from, uh, uh, from that one scientist, it seems to me to be a scientifically proven flag, fact that there is a divine being. He doesn't necessarily understand who his name is. That was more of a deduction. This is more of a cumulative case. You need to ask yourself, which creates more cognitive dissonance? Are you going to be like David and see it clearly and say, oh my goodness, if DNA is code, code f comes from coders. Who is the coder who has coded my DNA and every, that amoeba's DNA and every single piece of life on this planet and possibly elsewhere in the cosmos, who even knows? There has to be a coder. Or does it create less friction? And I can't believe that, that an honest person would say that it is easier for them to believe. No, it only appears to be code. And it only appears to have these functions that allow us to grow and breathe, and respirate, and procreate, and all of the other systems and mechanisms, and even our, our, our scientific teachers, they call it systems, which means that there must have been a systematizer. We call it code, we call it DNA language. 
which would require a coder or a linguist in order to write those things. We call them laws of nature, which would absolutely imply a lawgiver. But as, as people suppress the truth and unrighteousness, as Romans 1 says, they say, no, nah, it's easier for me to believe that it happened accidentally. If you encounter a person who is asking you, why is it that you believe in God? And it's an honest question. If you remember last week we said, one thing that apologetics does is it will reveal whether or not their questions are honest. Because this is a well-reasoned argument, a well-reasoned answer. All of us believe that right in here is code, language, thousands of volumes of it. Everything we've ever examined within the world that looks like language, looks like code, had a coder. Sorry about that. I have a few quotes. This is from Richard Dawkins that a uh, very famous atheist scientist. He says, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of design for a purpose. But don't trust your eyes. It appears that way, but it's not. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> you guys remember what that's from? That's, uh, oh, dang. Wizard of Oz, thank you. I had Alice in Wonderland stuck in my head. If it appears that way, Professor Dawkins, why shouldn't we believe it? Anthony Flew, this is an amazing person. Richard Dawkins, it was and is, and to this very day, a staunch, he doesn't, he doesn't debate with Christian apologists. Um, he, just, he just writes and gets attaboys from people who agree with him. Um, so he's like this. Anthony Flew, on the other hand, was an atheist, and when he encountered the, the evidence, he also uh, changed his tune to theism, but to my knowledge, uh, did not accept Christ Jesus as Lord. This was a very honest person who examined the evidence. He says, it now seems to me that the findings of more than 50 years of DNA research have provided materials for a new and enormously powerful argument to design. Finally, Francis Crick. Anybody remember who Francis Crick is? Watson and Crick, they were best buds. What did they discover? The shape of DNA, the double helix. Francis Crick went on to say this. The origin of life appears to be almost a miracle. So many are the conditions which would have had to be satisfied to get it going. Just like David, worshiping God in praise, he says, the things that happen inside me, Lord, are so astonishing. He doesn't even know what DNA is, but he's right. The things that are happening inside of us, smaller than David could have hoped to see at that time. And the tinier we get, the more true it is. You are so amazing, God. It is nigh miraculous. But so many people say, "Uh, uh, I'm not ready to believe in you. And it isn't for lack of evidence. It's not because our faith is unreasonable. It's because once you recognize that there is a God who created this world and is still involved in it, And then you ask the next question, uh, maybe he's revealed himself to us. Maybe we should examine some of these worldviews that conform to that way of thinking. I would say here here on earth, there are basically three that even possibly qualify. Christianity, Judaism, maybe, maybe Islam. But when we examine their truth claims, as we will on week four, please come back for week four, guys. I think that you will discover, daggone, this God who made this world, set the cosmos in motion, coded our DNA, created the ideal anthropic principle, this Goldilocks universe so that life could come about, made us because he loves us and has revealed himself to us in the person, Jesus Christ. Well, when we encounter that, we have a decision to make. Are we going to agree with him and the message that he has said, I have come here to rescue you from your sin? The things that you do that hurt yourself and hurt one another in an unjust way. These are sins, and they separate you from me, Jesus would be telling us. They separate you from God, who is the source of your life. This time goes on, and I'm begging you to accept this free gift of salvation, of forgiveness that I established for you on the cross, Jesus would be saying. But I won't wait forever. And time will come where the decisions have to be made, and he will return as you explain this or the cosmological argument, you don't even need to, you don't need to be intimidated by having it perfectly. Even just letting someone know that there are these reasons. Hey man, if, if, if you were to come face to face with a reality that, man, I think Jesus is true, would you believe him anyway? It's a very useful diagnostic question sometimes when you're having spiritual conversations. And if a person says, even if it were true, I wouldn't believe. 
pray for that person, but maybe find somebody who would be more reasonable. Because time is short, and there's a lot of people that need to hear this gospel. A few more pieces of information if you find this interesting. The DNA of one human cell equals 5 million pages of information. 25,200 25, page books to give it some sort of, if those numbers even begin, to, a 50 bajillion zillion million, right? It's incredible in a single human cell. All of that is crammed into the nucleus of a cell which is one one hundredth the width of human hair. And as I mentioned before, you have 100 trillion cells. I've done this a little bit out of order. I hope that that's, I get, I get excited. So hopefully you guys will bear with me. This will be the last bit of science-y information before we get to the so what, before we get to the close. Charles Darwin, who wrote Origins of Life, he said that he thinks that life could have come together, more or less, he didn't come up with this phrase, but by, by time and small adjustments and neo-Darwinists like Richard Dawkins have been, have been championing that to this very day. But actually at the highest level of, acad of academia, the foundations of that are beginning to crumble because of this concept of digital information. Frankly, it is computer science that has been showing the difficulty of some of this biology, philosophically speaking. But even Charles Darwin had a professor before him named Charles Lyell. And he said, science is not only the scientific method of repeated experiences. What about the science where we're trying to understand something that came before? We might call it forensic science. Detectives do it all the time. You're not doing a, an experiment when you, when you come to a crime scene. You're trying to employ reason effectively to know what happened there, right? We do the same thing with where did life come from? Where did this universe come from? But here's the thing that you ought to do. Whenever you are positing a theory about what could have caused this, we should give weight to causes now in operation. If DNA is code, what causes now in operation create code? coders. I believe that in every cell is sufficient evidence, the fingerprints of God, that someone designed you. Someone wrote your code so that you would be here. Loves you tremendously, and as we will find out through historical evidence uh, in the coming weeks, came here to rescue you from this fallen and broken state if we would only turn and believe in him. I want to say one more thing, and I'll probably say this every week. This is not God of the gaps reasoning. And there is such a thing as God of the gaps. I've seen it done and it makes, me, it makes me uncomfortable because we have very good arguments. God of the gaps would be something like this. Someone brings an argument to you and you're not so sure about what's going on. Or maybe no one even understands what's going on. And then the explanation is God did it. Basically every human culture has always done that. Where does thunder come from? Well, there's a God of thunder, right? Well, why does the river flow? Well, there's a God of the river. And why do the sardines come up the uh, east coast of Africa? Well, you know, you got to appease this God. It's a, it's a thing that humans do. We need to resist that, and that's not what's happening now. I am not saying that we don't understand DNA, therefore God wrote it. What I am saying is we understand it pretty darn well. And all of the evidence now points to a super intelligent being has written the code into our DNA, and it begins to sound a lot like what David said. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You knit me together in my mother's womb, and it inspires me to praise. I would go so far as to say that anyone who denies it, and this, you'll, you'll hear this in debates if you're surfing YouTube like a weirdo like I do, looking for answers to these sort of things. I actually think you will find an increase in atheism of the gaps explanations. That's what the blind watchmaker is basically saying. I know it looks like it's designed, but it's not. Why? Reasons. I hope that you guys, I hope that these are interesting sermons to you, encouraging sermons to you, that they make you feel more secure and excited about your own faith, but please don't let it stop right there. If you know someone who doesn't believe, if you know someone who fancies themselves a reasonable person, and let's hope that they are, if you know someone who would be interested in, daggone, the universe began to exist, and that means that someone must have created it. Daggone, I do have code within my DNA. Code comes from coders. What must that mean? Please share this. That alone doesn't get us to Jesus, but invite him back, and maybe we'll get him there together with the wooing of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We praise you and we thank you, not only for the truth of your word, but also that it is in 
perfect sync, that it is in lockstep, that it is in agreement with the truths that we can discover from your creation. 